this morning for me and for Chatham House to host the Honourable uh, Julie Bishop, Minister for Foreign Affairs for Australia. I think Julie has been in the Australian Parliament since 1998, is that right? That's right. And represents the constituency of Curtin in Western uh, Australia. She's been Foreign Minister since, well, since the government, uh, your six, party, six, six months. months. But before that, uh, held the shadow uh, uh, portfolio. Um, uh, one or two housekeeping uh, issues. Um, I'm supposed to say that people can comment via Twitter using <laughs> CH events and can ask questions it's using Ask Ch uh, Chatham House. No. Um, I I'm going to sort of talk a little to the minister at the beginning, perhaps for sort of about 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up to uh, um, questions. Uh, this event is also being uh, live uh, streamed. And at the end, if everybody could remain seated for a while while I escort um, the, the minister out. Um, now, the minister was here principally for Auckland, the Australian-UK uh, ministerial uh, meeting. Perhaps you could tell us a little about that, how, how it went, the issues you, you, you looked at. This is an annual meeting of the foreign and defence ministers and counterparts of Australia and the United Kingdom. This is the sixth Auckman, and we met yesterday for a full day. We discussed a range of bilateral issues, essentially focusing on areas of cooperation between Australia and the United Kingdom, and identifying new areas where we can cooperate and work together. We also discussed global and regional issues of concern. Uh, the United Kingdom led on Ukraine, Syria, mm. South Sudan, Somalia mm. and others, Afghanistan. Australia led the discussions on um, <coughs> the Asia Pacific, mm. Indian Ocean. And then we had a, a discussion in the afternoon about defence cooperation mm -hmm. and held a press conference where we confirmed a number of new areas where we'll cooperate and further. Um, specifically in relation to our diplomatic footprint overseas, we um, both decided that there are ways to use our resources more efficiently and effectively if we work together. Um, also signed a new partnership agreement in relation to the delivery of overseas development assistance. And we find we have very similar views about what I'll call the new paradigm of um, aid delivery and we hope to work together mm. on some major uh, projects for the delivery of foreign aid into uh, our region, into the Pacific, but elsewhere. It, it's, it's quite a surprise in a way, Orkman, because it, this has worked, and as you say, it's now the sixth uh, meeting. I mean, there was a period during the 80s and 90s where whilst we were both still members of the Commonwealth, it looked as if Britain was getting more and more engaged in Europe, you and Australia were getting more engaged uh, in Asia, and perhaps the ties were not as close as, as they are now. So certainly, personally, this is something that I uh, really uh, welcome. Um, but is this going to be an enduring uh, institution, you think? I mean, governments come and go. How do we sort of embed this in uh, our two countries' foreign policies? It is a fact that the relationship between Australia and the United Kingdom is one of the closest international relationships. I can think of few that are closer in terms of our historic, uh, political, uh, economic, cultural, sporting ties. Mm -hmm. And uh, the relationship endures. You're right, uh, over recent years, there had been a tendency for Australia and the United Kingdom to go their own ways. But there is so much more of a focus on the Asia Pacific as the economic weight moves from uh, Europe to mm. Asia, it was inevitable that the United Kingdom, being such a significant economic power, would look mm. to the Asia Pacific and look to our region to mm. more deeply engage. And clearly Australia would be an mm. ideal partner in many areas. Absolutely. And that's what we're seeing now, our mm. cooperation mm. in a broad range of areas mm. in the Asia Pacific, but also um, we're together in Afghanistan, we're yes. working together in um, many theatres. Mm. So I believe it is enduring, it will be enduring. Mm -hmm. and, um, so Even if we have changes of government, which will be inevitable at some stage in both countries. I don't think that uh, mm. that will make any difference. In fact, Auckland is held uh, 
um, when the Labor government's in power in Australia and Correct. when the Labor government's in power in, mm. in uh, the United Kingdom, we just have a happy circumstance at present where two mm. Conservative governments are in power. I feel very comfortable about that. I, 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 I can imagine, yeah. Um, ca can I move on to talk about uh, your neighbour to the north, in Indonesia? Um, it's, it's, it's your closest neighbour and it's... A, I think both governments have tried to develop uh, a strategic relationship, particularly during the, the presidency of um, President Yudo Yono, uh, who I think has set great store on uh, having close ties between Jakarta and Canberra. Uh, inevitably, there are always ups and downs in these sort of relationships. It took quite a knock, though, with the, the Snowden affair. Um, do, you, do you think that that's done... I mean, Tempers were high in Indonesia, and the, the foreign minister said strong things, even the president did. Are you over that now? This is a very resilient relationship. Mm. It's been built up over a long period of time. We've had many challenges in the past over uh, territorial issues, um, over a whole range of matters that have tested the relationship. But there's a great deal of ballast in it, mm. and that comes down to the government-to-government -government ties, the business ties, and the people-to-people -people lengths. And yes, it, it's a difficult time um, when the Snowden um, allegations became public, and uh, we had to work with Indonesia in relation to it. But my belief is that the relationship is strong enough. It's too important for us not to be sure that it works. And um, we will take their concerns seriously, as we have been, but we also know that it's a much broader and deeper relationship mm. than just one issue. And we cooperate on so many levels. In fact, right. Foreign Minister Marty Natalgawa and I had done a stock take of our relationship prior to the Snowden allegations becoming public. And we found that there were about 60 areas where Australia mm. and Indonesia cooperated in terms of treaties or agreements or frameworks, dialogues. Um, involving about 22 Australian government departments, uh, mm. agencies, authorities, and a similar number in Indonesia. So you can see that there's considerable mm. depth to the relationship, mm. and we mm. will ensure that that continues. Good. I mean, at one point, I think you were talking about a sort of um, code of conduct. Um, uh, that was not the terminology. That was not the terminology. That was a no. press term. No, that was a. And that's an ABC term. Oh, well, there we are then. Okay. Mm. And I'm sure that the BBC would have got around to that right. yesterday if mm -hmm. they had managed to get off the asylum seeker issue. Mm. So the... I'm glad you met John Humphreys. But yes. Go on. <laughs> yes, I was going to no, ask... No, it, no visitor to the UK should uh, be <laughs> I was spared. going to ask at one point mm. that um, I assume he'd worked out that I was the foreign minister and we could mm. talk about foreign mm. policy, but mm. anyway, not to no, be... That was a, something of an assumption minister, if I say <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> now, where were we? Um, uh, uh, about Indonesia and the code of... Indeed. We agreed that uh, there would be a joint understanding between us on matters of sovereignty and cooperation, and we're still working through that. Mm -hmm. Indonesia Good. has mm. elections coming up. There'll yes. Be, there'll be legislative elections yeah. in April, and then a presidential, presidential. election. Mm. And of course, President um, Yudhoyono will not be restanding. No. He's had his, mm. his um, mm. constitutional term, and we will be sorry to see him go. He's been a, very supportive mm. of the Australia-Indonesia relationship. Mm. But uh, whomever the people of Indonesia choose as their president, mm. we will work closely with them. Very good. Uh, can we take, uh, turn to one of your neighbours even further north, um, China? Um, I mean, the economic relationship between your two countries is, is, is quite extraordinary. Um, I think 31% of your exports, and roughly a third, go to China. And if you compare that, say, to Germany, it's only 6%. The United um, States, only 9%. E exactly. Mm. Um, that, that leads to quite a degree of dependence, doesn't it? I noticed um, on, on Monday, Beijing reported some rather poor economic figures for, well, you wonder what poor economic figures mean for China uh, in, in the last month or so. And, and immediately, the Sydney Stock Exchange was sort of jittering and sort of came down uh, by a percentage or two. Well, Is that right. a concern for you? Uh, well, we Must are, be. We are very reliant on our trading relationship with China, and this has built up over time. And for the previous 40 years, Japan mm. was our largest two-way merchandise 
trading right. partner uh, today, it's China, and that's built on the back of China's um, impressive growth and need for mm. um, Australian commodities. And you're right, 30, over 30% 30 of our exports go to China, and when you see a, um, a change in their economic indicators, as we did on Monday, mm. Australia feels the pain more than others. Uh, but likewise, it's been very important for us to maintain a strong economic relationship with China. It's seen us through some difficult times. Right. The global financial crisis did not affect Australia as it did other countries for a number of reasons. But one of the major reasons was because China's insatiable demand mm. for Australian commodities, mm. and energy and resources and mm. iron ore coal continued. It is a very important relationship and we hope to deepen the economic engagement even further by negotiating and concluding a free trade agreement with mm. China. And this is an mm. imperative for us. Mm. Our dear friends, the New Zealanders, concluded right. a free trade agreement with China in 2008, mm. and they've seen their exports to China mm. um, increase exponentially. So um, we compete with New Zealand in, mm. in agricultural areas particularly, so we're very keen to conclude a free trade mm. agreement. And I think that that will enmesh our economies even more. There's also the question of foreign direct investment. Um, China is uh, nowhere near at the level of um, foreign investment that we have from the United States, which is our largest mm. investor, and then the mm. United Kingdom second. Right. But uh, that will change over time as, mm -hmm. as China uh, looks to invest globally. Right. I mean, we, uh, we're in the year, of course, of the centenary of the First World War, and uh, that's being looked back at, and people are drawing parallels with the world in 2014, and many people are sort of seeing uh, the US as the sort of Britain of 1914 as a sort of declining global power, and China as, a, if you like, akin to the Germany of 1914 the, as the rising power. Um, and one looks at things such as the fairly rapid development of the Chinese Navy, which was almost non-existent about a decade ago, and now the Chinese fleets go through the Java Straits and the Lombok Straits. Uh, this must be something of concern to uh, Australia. And I, I have noted the, uh, the discussions, obviously, uh, on the centenary of World War I about uh, similarities and whether the United States' alleged containment policy towards China resembles what um, Britain was trying to do with Germany in World War I, but I don't think the parallels can go too far. Um, I think that history is, well, let's hope history is unlikely to repeat itself. Yeah. And the circumstances are um, significantly different. I think the United States and China are managing their relationship mm. um, in a very positive way. Mm. It's uh, mutually mm. reinforcing. Mm. They both need each other. Mm. And uh, I think that mm. um, the increase in military spending in China, we don't quite know the detail of it because the level of transparency that one would hope for isn't isn't there yet. Well, this, this is a big question, of that course, is a question. In, in, in that area as in so many others, the transparency is not there. But uh, it's inevitable that as China becomes a, a, a greater global economic power that it mm. will um, increase its military spending. Mm. Uh, it's, it's the way the narrative is... Uh, is rolled out from Beijing, I think, and there needs to be much more discussion about mm. um, their motives and plans and mm. um, continue to work closely with mm. other countries in the region who are affected by right. their increase in military spending. What it has meant is that a number of the Southeast Asian economies, likewise um, growing exponentially, mm. they are also increasing spending mm -hmm. in the military sphere. So some say it's mm. a mini arms race. I don't know that we need to put it at that level. Right. But there has been um, quite a significant increase in military spending in our region. And, of course, Japan has now mm. um, adopted a more, what I'd say, normal defence posture and is increasing um, mm. spending militarily. Right. I think it's just a natural reflection of the economic strength of the region. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the United States has announced in recent years that it will um, refocus or um, rebalance its efforts in the Asia-Pacific. Again, that is a natural consequence of the growing importance of the Asia-Pacific, economically and strategically. It's, it, it's a natural, you mentioned the US and the pivot to a Asia. 
in some ways it is a natural consequence, obviously, uh, but the US by definition is a global power. And do you really think that the pivot has, has, has worked? Um, I mean, the administration obviously is still very engaged in Afghanistan and the Middle East and so on. And that's kind of distracted from the pivot, hasn't it? But they'd never left the Asia Pacific. So mm. when we talk about a, um, a pivot to, the United States had never left. It's just a re-emphasis. And when you say, has it worked? Well, it is working. Countries in the region seek more US leadership, not less. Right. And it's not only in um, defence and strategic terms, it's also in economic. And this finds mm. its expression in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a free mm. trade agreement that is currently under negotiation mm. between 12 countries that mm. currently all have free trade agreements with mm. each other, but it now includes Japan. And if the Trans-Pacific Partnership mm. is able to be concluded this year, Mm. then you are part way towards this vision of a, an Asia-Pacific free trade zone. Right. Uh, it doesn't include China, but interestingly, over the last mm. two years, China has seen the Trans-Pacific Partnership less in terms of a containment policy and more in terms of an opportunity mm. for there to be greater mm. trade liberalisation in our region. Right. Right. <coughs> Minister, one area which doesn't get much attention in the UK is, is the South Pacific, which of course is on your doorstep, and yes. Papua New Guinea, and, but, but particularly Fiji. Um, I'm, I'm, I wonder if you could update us on how you see things in Fiji now, what the bilateral relationship is like. Um, we did talk about Fiji yesterday uh -huh. with um, Foreign Secretary Haig, mm. because of course Fiji um, is a member of the Commonwealth, Correct. currently under suspension. Yes. So the UK does have an interest in yes. Fiji, mm. and we certainly encourage a greater engagement mm. now that I believe Fiji is on the path back to a democracy. The coup in 2006 led to the imposition of travel sanctions by mm. Australia, New Zealand and, and others. Right. And over the last um, few years, I came to the realisation that um, if there was going to be an election held in Fiji, mm. as um, Prime Minister Bainimarama promised in 2014, then Australia needed to begin a much deeper engagement. There's no point mm. in waiting till the day after the election being deemed free and fair, or right. free and fair enough, mm. and then Australia turning up on the doorstep and saying, OK, mm. you're back in the fold. We need to build up to that point. Mm. So. Last year, I, uh, once we came into office in September, right. mm. um, we changed our foreign policy towards Fiji to mm. normalise the relations. <coughs> I have now met with Prime Minister Bainy Marama. I'm the first Australian minister to meet with him since mm. 2008. Mm. It was a very productive meeting. I am satisfied at this point that preparations are underway for an election to be held before the end of September this mm. year. They have appointed... You think that'll go ahead? Yeah. They have appointed independent electoral commissioners. They've opened their uh, voting registration. A country mm. of about eight or 900,000 people, they've got over 540,000 registered voters at this point, right. including in Australia and the United States and elsewhere. Mm. And uh, we and New Zealand are supporting their efforts mm. to hold an election. And they have a new constitution. Mm. Um, it's good enough. And... Mm. We're looking forward to an election being held mm. in September. Mm. And at that point, I hope that we mm. will have engaged far more deeply yeah. uh, through public sector mm. exchanges, um, our defence attaché going back into Fiji mm -hmm. uh, at every level. Um, mm. Our patrol boat program that we have in the Pacific, including Fiji in that. Mm. The PACER <coughs> Plus, which is a free trade negotiation in the Pacific, right. including Fiji there and I hope that we will see them back as a fully functioning democracy um, in the Commonwealth and a leader in the Pacific. Okay, well, let's, let, let's hope so. Well, I'm going to open it up now to um, questions uh, from the floor. Um, please, uh, if you wait for the mic to come to you and if you could kindly identify yourself before you pose a question. Madam Minister, my name is Yunal Chevikos. I'm the Turkish ambassador. Australia is hosting G20 this year. That's right. And uh, 
we know that uh, G20 is uh, representing uh, a more uh, uh, global uh, economic interest because it also includes the emerging economies. Uh, and now that particularly after the situation in Ukraine, G8 is having some difficulties. Uh, could you explain us uh, what the vision of Australia is for G20? Mm. And since Turkey is going to take over from you next year, uh, what kind of a vision could you develop this year so that it can continue with the Turkish presidency as a sustainable vision? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. We see the G20 as the um, preeminent leaders forum uh, in terms of um, global financial matters. And it commenced as a finance ministers forum and Australia was a, an early supporter of the G20 in that format. It's now a leaders forum and Australia will be hosting the G20 meeting in Brisbane in November of this year. In order for the forum to be um, more than just uh, a response or reaction to financial crises as it has been in the past, we hope that it becomes a sustainable, enduring forum. And so therefore it has to have an agenda that um, attracts and maintains the attention of the very busy leaders who are represented um, around the table. Australia intends to have a, quite a narrow focus, but one that will appeal, we believe, across the various economies and um, members represented. Um, we are focusing on, um, obviously, economic growth. Uh, we're focusing on job opportunities, on um, infrastructure, on the um, tax system, global tax system. So it's a narrower agenda. We also hope to have a leaders retreat whereby just the leaders, and no offence, but no um, others <laughs> will be present. So just the leaders can talk openly and candidly about um, issues of concern and issues where the G20 can um, stimulate economic growth globally. And there'll also be obviously the focus on overseas development assistance through the C20, um, business opportunities through the B20. And we hope that with this uh, very targeted and focused agenda on economic growth and job opportunities uh, and um, the sub-headline items, mm. that it will set the G20 up to be an enduring organisation and hopefully we'll hand it over in very good shape so that Turkey can take it on next year. Very good. Question right here in the, in the front, if you wait a second. So. I see lots of hands going up in the front row. This is I'm not the uh, so Ambassador of Latvia. Thank you, Madam Minister, for an excellent uh, expose of uh, priorities of trillion uh, foreign policy. Uh, as Latvia is going to assume next year um, presidency of EU, uh, could you uh, elaborate your, your vision or your priorities? Uh, what, what are you expecting? from uh, Australia and EU in relationship in the upcoming future. Thank you. We have a very strong trade and investment relationship with the EU. Um, as, a, as a block, it's our um, largest trading partner you know, collectively. And I expect that will continue to be the basis of our relationship with the EU. Uh, the new coalition government is unambiguously focusing our foreign policy efforts on our region, the Indian Ocean, Asia Pacific, but that doesn't mean that we don't also have interests that are uh, global and interests um, that coincide with those of the EU. So we'll continue to work closely. We do have um, a framework agreement <coughs> under negotiation with the EU. We hope that that uh, can be concluded because that will take the Australia-EU relationship to a, a new level. Uh, so I'm looking forward to meeting Baroness Ashton when she comes to Australia. She's mm and been diverted from her <coughs> intentions to come by a number of pretty serious issues. And we are looking forward to her visit so that we can um, look at other ways where we can continue to build our connections between Australia and the EU. Thank you. Gentlemen here. Good morning, Madam Minister. My name is Euripides. I'm High Commissioner of Cyprus. Uh, you mentioned the Commonwealth within the framework of what is happening in Fiji. You participated in, uh, in Colombo when we had the Chogom, not exactly the easiest Chogoms that we went through. Um, this week we mark uh, 
uh, uh, Commonwealth Week, yes. the theme being Team Commonwealth. I wonder if you care to share with us some of your uh, uh, approaches. You, you have been a leader in the Commonwealth. May I also use the, the term vision as well? Mm. Uh, your vision about the Commonwealth. How do you see things approaching? The relevance in today's world? Because some of these things are sometimes being questioned and, and, and mm. I would like you to comment mm. if possible. Thank you. We value our membership of the Commonwealth because we believe it is uh, a unique uh, club in terms of the diversity of the membership. And I think that the charter um, of the Commonwealth certainly sets out the values um, that Australia adheres to. Our foreign policy is designed not only to project and protect our reputation as an open, um, export-oriented market economy, but also an open, liberal democracy committed to freedoms, rule of law, democratic institutions. And if the Commonwealth can continue to promote those values, then it has great relevance in the world. I, for one, would encourage other nations that wish to adhere to those principles and values to join the Commonwealth. I know there's a view that the Commonwealth should be contained to those who were once part of the great British Empire, but I think that if there are countries who wish to be part of an organisation committed to those values and who takes action to enforce it, then uh, we should encourage it. The Commonwealth has been through some difficult times before. We've had mm. to expel members, we've had to suspend membership, but overall I think that um, talking about mm -hmm. enduring, enduring organisations, right. I believe the Commonwealth is one yes. because mm. of its diversity, mm. because it covers uh, so many continents. Mm. And uh, the Chogham meetings are, yeah, they're, mm. they're different, but mm. um, as long as we don't have to spend two days drafting uh, every communique, I think that the mm. Chogham meetings have some real value. And I've certainly, I, I found Colombo to be particularly useful uh, because I was able to make contact with a number of countries that I wouldn't otherwise mm. um, have an opportunity to meet. And that's important for Australia's overall foreign policy. Mm. Uh, gentleman in the second row here. At the end. Um, Mark, Mark Robinson, I'm chair of the Commonwealth Organisations Committee on Zimbabwe. Uh, Australia has taken a great interest uh, in uh, Zimbabwe and recently they uh, held a an election that um, produced a substantive result, although perhaps we wouldn't use the word credible. But I just wonder how you see relations with Zimbabwe, now this government is in place, going forwards rather than looking backwards. Zimbabwe is one of those uh, lost opportunities over recent decades. I was a Commonwealth observer in Zimbabwe in 2000 uh, when there was a general election in 2002 when there was a presidential right. election mm. and uh, was part of the Commonwealth reporting team that led to uh, Chogham um, concluding that the presidential election in 2002 was neither free nor fair. And so <coughs> I have a, a particular personal perspective on the way elections are conducted in Zimbabwe, having seen it up close um, on two occasions. Uh, we are looking forward to a time when um, President Mugabe is no longer the leader. I think his influence in, in recent decades has been um, overwhelmingly negative. I think that um, Zimbabwe has a great future, um, but we're not seeing it uh, realise anywhere near its potential at present. Um, the fact that there is now a government in place it should be focusing on providing economic opportunities for its people. And it's heartbreaking to see mm. what's happened to Zimbabwe mm. since uh, mm. independence. Mm. I think the Commonwealth um, would have had a role to play, but of course mm. we're now no longer part of the equation. So it comes down very much to the Southern African nations mm. in supporting Zimbabwe back to some form of stability and economic prosperity. It has so much potential. Uh, we have a lot to do with Zimbabweans. There are many Zimbabweans who have left over the years and um, working in Australia. They have tended to come in waves. 
we currently have a number of Zimbabwean students studying in Australia. Mm. So the connections are still there, but we maintain um, sanctions on, travel sanctions in particular, on um, President Mugabe and his regime. Mm. Thank you. Michael Keating. Um, <coughs> Foreign Minister, you mentioned uh, Afghanistan and Australia has made a heavy commitment and paid yes. a high price for its involvement. And this is a difficult year, elections and uh, withdrawal of the international military and uh, <coughs> security. What will shape Australia's continued engagement in Afghanistan beyond 2014? Um, both our nations have paid a heavy price. I think in uh, the UK that's been in the form of about 440 or more of your finest being killed in Afghanistan and about 40 Australian soldiers have died in, uh, in the cause of um, ensuring that Afghanistan never again becomes a haven for terrorism. Uh, it's been mm. a hefty price, so one wouldn't want to leave Afghanistan without a legacy that will endure. Um, we are obviously watching very closely what happens in the elections in April, also the relations with the United States and the um, <coughs> signing of a strategic agreement. Um, we will work closely with our friends and allies who are in Afghanistan to see what a post-2014 Afghanistan will look like. Um, we won't walk away from our commitment, it's just a question of in what form it will take. Um, Australia has done a lot, as has the United Kingdom, in training and mentoring the security forces. And we hope that that will serve us well in ensuring that there's a level of um, responsibility taken by the Afghan government and backed up by a well-trained and mentored um, security force. Uh, we've also been heavily involved in the nation-building side of things, if I can put it that way. and. Uh, when I hear the statistics about the number of girls now attending school in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. I think that we've certainly made a worthwhile contribution. And we don't want that to go backwards. Mm -hmm. We don't want to see the gains made lost um, because of a lack of presence or commitment and commitment of resources of mm -hmm. um, those who are so keen to see a more prosperous and viable Afghanistan. Mia mm -hmm. Jimson, second row here. My name is Akio Miyajima at the Embassy of Japan. I'm also the current visiting fellow of the Chatham House the Academy. Uh, I would like to, to, to learn from you about your assessment of after one year of Mr. Abe's mm. yeah, economic and also security <coughs> view. And also that the prospect for the, the Australia-Japan relationship. Which area you would like to see the ball development? Mm -hmm. Australian-Japan relationships are very strong and have been for many years. I still marvel over the fact that uh, we were able to restore relations so quickly after the Second World War with the signing of a commerce agreement in 1957, which essentially set our economic relationship, our trade and investment mm. relationship. And uh, we continue to value very much our, our trading relationship uh, with Japan. It's very important to us. And we've had um, Japanese companies operating in Australia for 40, 50 years, and it's been um, a very beneficial two-way relationship. But it's much deeper than that. Uh, we recognise that Japan is a strong democracy in North Asia, committed to the same values as Australia, and uh, we work closely together in so many fields. For example, the new Australian government has introduced a new student scheme that we've dubbed the New Colombo Plan, just as the original Colombo plan of the 1950s and 1960s um, saw Australia bring to our universities some of the best and brightest young people in the region. Mm. Um, I think over 30 years, about 40,000 mm. young people studied in Australian universities and lived with Australian families and set up connections for life. We are reversing that, and this will be a Commonwealth-backed scheme that will see young Australian undergraduates undertake studies at universities in the region. And part of that is for them to also have an internship working with a business that's operating in the host country. Well, cut a long story short, we uh, have commenced with a pilot program this year. And Japan is one of four countries that's taking part in the pilot program. And what that will do is 
excite that interest in Japan-Australia relations. We're hoping the students will learn the language, absorb themselves in Japanese culture and social life and political life, as well as studying at uh, one of your fine universities and come back to Australia with new perspectives and ideas and insights on the Australia-Japan relationship. So it is strong, it is enduring. Uh, in relation to Prime Minister Abe, we have um, supported the um, more normal defence posture uh, that uh, Prime Minister Abe has announced. Uh, we note um, the Abenomics focus of your economic policy and a strong Japan is in everybody's interests. So we're certainly um, very supportive of Prime Minister Abe and I believe that there's already been quite a rapport established between um, Prime Minister Abe and Prime Minister Abbott. Indeed, Prime Minister Abbott will be visiting Japan soon and we have negotiations underway for a free trade agreement with Japan which will take our economic relationship to another level and that's very important for us. Uh, we are great friends. We don't agree on every issue and when we don't agree we let you know, uh, likewise. Uh, but um, overall we, uh, we think that um, there is uh, still much to, be, much to be done in the Australia-Japan relationship and personally I think the best days of our relationship are still ahead of us. I noticed in the ministerial dialogue there was a commitment by Australia and the United Kingdom to sort of deepen uh, discussions about Asia yes. and in particular a sort of potential link up I think between the Ditchley Foundation here in the UK and um, the Lowy Institute in uh, Sydney where I uh, visited uh, last year and which I uh, value greatly. Do you want to say anything more about well, that? Well, I believe that's a recognition mm. on the part of the United Kingdom mm -hmm. that um, Asia is important, that right. you have interests mm. here, that Australia mm. has a, a particular perspective on, um, on Asia, Southeast Asia. It's, mm. it's where we live, um, it's where we do most of our business, um, probably about eight out of our top ten trading partners are in the Asia-Pacific, so mm -hmm. it's very much our neighbourhood. Uh, we also have a perspective on um, things like the current tensions between China and Japan over the Senkaku <coughs> Daoyu Islands, uh, the territorial claims in the South China Sea. These are matters where Australia has, um, we believe, an interest in seeing the peaceful resolution of those issues. We don't take sides, but we mm -hmm. certainly um, have a perspective and we're happy to share that with the United Kingdom, so this one and a half track mm -hmm. dialogue between um, Ditchley Park and Lowy mm -hmm. will be an opportunity for us to discuss some of the more complex issues in a more detailed uh, way, mm -hmm. and I certainly hope that that takes off. Mm -hmm. Australia is a part of a number of dialogues around the world, the um, Australian mm -hmm. American dialogue and, and others, so right. setting up something with uh, Ditchley Park and Lowy, I think, mm -hmm. will be um, just more ballast for this relationship. Good. Good. I wonder if I could ask John Holmes, who is of course director of Ditchley, to, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to add anything you'd like to say this on that. This is your John. opportunity for an advertisement. <laughs> well, I, uh, I hope we don't need advertisement, but we're very much looking forward to the dialogue, um, mm. as we were discussing the other day, and I think we can make a contribution to, to deepening that relationship, not just the bilateral mm. relationship, but deepening that discussion about Asia. And I mm. agree with the point you were making that I don't think we're thinking enough about Asia in Europe, so I think maybe this is a, a brick in that wall which will help to develop that relationship. But as I've been handing the microphone, can mm. I ask you another question, which is going back to what Michael was saying about your relationship with China, the, the trade figures mm. are very striking. Yes. Yeah. Now, you were saying earlier, quite rightly, that let's not overdo the, relation, the, 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 the comparisons between 1914 and 2014. Mm. Let's not overdo the comparisons either between Russia and China. However, um, one of the things that's been commented on widely at the moment here and elsewhere in, in, in the West is mm. the the difficulty if you want to take sanctions against Russia over Ukraine, for example, the, the complexity of the economic relationships make it a bit harder. Yes. If something were to happen in Asia, which we don't want to see, between mm. China and Japan, or Japan and one of its other neighbors, which could be presented as assertiveness or aggression or whatever you want to call it, mm. how much do you think you'd be constrained in what you would say or do about it by the fact that your economic relationship Mm. Dependence, Michael called it, mm. but it's, of course it's mutual, no doubt. Uh, how much do you think you could be constrained by that relationship about what you said or did about it? Well, Australia is not the only nation that counts China as its number one trading partner. At last count, it was 123 
nations around the world consider oh. China their mm -hmm. number one mm -hmm. two-way trading partner. Uh, so obviously economic imperatives will yeah. play into um, the consideration of a number of countries around the world. But um, our focus is always on the peaceful resolution of any um, tensions or issues. Um, in the case of Ukraine, that's what we've been calling for, um, dialogue, diplomacy. Likewise with tensions between uh, China and Japan. They are both very important <coughs> nations to us. We have considerable interests in North Asia and, and um, Southeast Asia and South Asia. And so Australia will always stand up for our national interests um, unapologetically. And if we believe that um, China or Japan um, should de-escalate tensions, um, should take certain steps, because we believe we have an interest in that outcome, we will say it. Uh, likewise, I would expect that in the case of Ukraine, if the European Union comes to a particular view that Russia has gone too far, that this um, intervention in Ukraine um, transgresses Ukraine's sovereignty, as most certainly it has. Uh, the referendum in Crimea on the weekend, uh, the outcome of that and the consequences of it, if the European Union comes to the view that sanctions should be imposed, uh, then I'm sure that as difficult as it may be, economically speaking, it will be the right thing to do. So um, there's a limit to what we can do in relation to this, particularly through the UN Security Council. Australia is currently a temporary member of the UN Security Council. And of course, with the veto power, um, there's only so much that can be achieved in the Security Council. And talk of a resolution now, well, if you're going to get um, the support of all the P5. I'm just wondering what the wording will look like uh, and how mm. effective it will be. But that's where the European Union and the United Kingdom becomes even more important in mm. sending a message and setting a standard and, and drawing a line and saying this behaviour is not acceptable in terms of uh, an international rules-based order. Mm. Carl, the Carl Wright, uh, Commonwealth Local Government Forum. Um, Minister, you mentioned the Commonwealth earlier, and um, I was recently in New York uh, observing one of the um, UN sessions on the post-2015 development agenda, one of the, the working groups which are doing negotiations about the future uh, development agenda post-2015. Uh, in Colombo, which of course you, you attended, um, the Commonwealth did take a position on, on development and post-2015, and I think there's going to be a, a leader's statement on, on this with, of the Commonwealth. Um, do you see that there is a potential there taking also into account some of the divisions which took place in Colombo between Commonwealth countries on development and democracy, or of the Commonwealth bridging some of the issues on developmental issues at the United Nations and playing a stronger role, bringing together, say, the G77 and the G20 on, on post-2015. And do you think the proposed Commonwealth statement uh, of, of <coughs> leaders on post-2015 could play a role there? Mm. Well, the strength of the Commonwealth is its diversity and the fact that it has members across um, all the continents from South America and Africa and Asia and Australia <coughs> and beyond Europe. And uh, I think that uh, the Commonwealth could have a role to play. Uh, there is division and differences of opinion within the Commonwealth, as Colombo certainly demonstrated. Uh, but um, there is an opportunity for the Commonwealth to speak um, as one voice on this issue. We have a, a particular view on um, overseas development assistance and the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. Our focus is very much, it seems to me, aligned mm. with uh, what mm. the United Kingdom is doing at present. And that is, uh, we believe that the alleviation of poverty uh, can best be achieved by economic growth and providing um, opportunities for nations to grow their economies to provide jobs and um, secure futures for their citizens. And uh, we've had um, some very good discussions with the UK about um, leveraging the private sector in overseas development assistance, mm. in um, aid for trade, in um, focusing on the economic empowerment of women. Um, I'm thinking particularly in our region, these are priorities for us. So if we can bring our um, world view of overseas development assistance and, um, and development goals, along with Britain and other like-minded, then hopefully there can be some 
um, influential outcomes that the Commonwealth has contributed to. But it's not an easy, it's not an easy area, and uh, I know that um, I know that uh, the Commonwealth finds it difficult to come up with a united position on some of these more contentious areas. But I think, of course, we have a role to play, given the membership of you know, over 50 or more countries. Mm. It's important. Mr. Can I ask about North Korea? There was a mm. devastating UN report, I think just over a week ago, written by one of your most distinguished Australian uh, jurists, uh, who's Justice Kirby, yes. um, which was one of the most robust and uh, critical reports about the human rights situation in, in an individual country that I've, I've seen coming from uh, the UN. And of course, one's concern about the human rights situation uh, within North Korea is matched by worries about uh, its nuclear weapons. Um, this must be an, an issue of, of uh, anxiety for Australia. Is it something that you, you can raise in, in, a, in a robust way with the, the Chinese? And oh, most certainly, mm. we, we have and we do. Uh, North Korea is not only a regional threat, it's a global threat. Mm. And we're deeply concerned about its um, commitment to developing nuclear weapons and uh, we join with other countries in the region and around the world in calling for um, North Korea to denuclearize. We see China as key to that. Uh, China is <coughs> essentially their only friend mm. and China has a, I, I believe, considerable leverage mm. over North Korea. Um, I think it's fair to say that China shares our frustrations from time mm. to time over the uh, conduct of Kim Jong-un and his regime. But that report was a devastating indictment yeah. mm. of the regime. The six-party talks um, have stalled. We urge for a, um, mm. a refocus on the six-party talks. And I might say that uh, in our discussions with our friends from China and Japan and South Korea, who currently have mm. some unresolved mm. historic issues, um, we ask them to put that in context, that they should all be focusing mm. on what we can do about North Korea and the, and the um, Korean Peninsula. So resolve the issues between them so that we can actually focus on the big mm. game, the big picture, which is uh, North Korean nuclear ambitions. Yeah, and you, you have an embassy in Pyongyang? No, we don't. You don't? Okay. No, you do. Yes, we do. Yes. <laughs> well, in, in fact, it, only, only recently we um, found how difficult it can be not, not having Mm. Uh, representation in North mm. Korea because we had uh, an Australian um, who was a practicing Christian and decided I, I, that he yes. was going to convert North mm. Korea mm. single-handedly and he... Was that ambitious? He, uh, yes, yeah. he mm. uh, was obviously detained and mm. we had very limited access. We worked through um, the Swedes, the Swedish embassy there, mm -hmm. but without um, consular representation or without representation on the ground, mm. it's, it's very opaque. Mm. Um, he has been released and mm. all's, Thank goodness. Mm. Um, all's well, but it just did give an indication of how challenging it can be if you don't mm. have representation. And one of the things we discussed, I've segue nicely into this, one of the things that we discussed at um, Orkman yeah. uh, was our uh, sharing of resources so that mm. both the United Kingdom and Australia can right. um, spread our diplomatic footprint, but in um, a cost-effective way, mm. ever mindful of the... Australian British taxpayer, mm -hmm. we, uh, we think that by sharing sort of back of house resources, we might be able to expand our footprint and mm -hmm. that, might, that might include North Korea. Right. I know it's going to include Iraq, isn't it? We're, we're UK and Australia are going to. Baghdad, yes, we, we have announced Baghdad. that. Mm -hmm. uh, the security situation in Baghdad is such that yeah. Uh, yeah, we spend an, mm -hmm. an incredible amount of money on security right. mm -hmm. and we believe that um, the United Kingdom's got some mm -hmm. space. So we might as well become mm -hmm. your tenant, right. and I think that will I think that will serve our purposes mm -hmm. rather well. It, 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 I mean, there are obviously unique circumstances in in Baghdad because of the uh, extraordinary security um, uh, issues. But is, is that something that's going to be happen elsewhere? Though, that co-location? Uh, we are. We are pursuing um, other opportunities. We think that it, it wouldn't work in every instance. There might no. be places where. Mm. 
um, we think that that's not a good idea, but most certainly in Baghdad, where we mm. have been there together for such a long time and we have shared interests, we mm. think that that's an opportunity. I think Canada might actually be part of that as well. Mm. Um, we have had discussions with other uh, mm. like-minded nations about sharing uh, resources, mm. uh, not only with the UK but with others, because uh, some nations have a greater concentration of di diplomatic posts, say, in Africa and Australia doesn't, yes, but because there is mm. so much Australian mm. business being done in Africa, right. we feel that we should have a greater mm. presence there. But mm. again, mindful of the cost to, mm. to taxpayers. But I think that we need to focus um, more on expanding our diplomatic footprint, and that's mm. certainly a policy of, of our government to mm. do that. And if we can do it in a more effective way in sharing resources right. with uh, mm. our good friends that we can trust mm. and rely on, well, then I think yep. that's a, a smart thing to do. Excellent. We take one or two more questions. Gentleman here on the right, and then uh, gentleman there. Simon Spanswick from the Association for International Broadcasting. You've been talking about um, diplomacy. Mm. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Australia's soft power in public diplomacy because yeah. we've seen nations like Vietnam and Myanmar starting international television services targeting your patch. And at the mm. same time, there's been discussion in the past few weeks about the possible closure of your international television service. Can you talk a bit about the importance mm. or otherwise of international broadcasting from Australia? Mm. Uh, we have a significant focus on... Um, soft power diplomacy, uh, we call it economic diplomacy when we are pursuing our economic interests um, and just as the traditional aim of um, diplomacy is peace, the, tr the aim of economic diplomacy is prosperity. Uh, the new Colombo plan that I spoke about <coughs> earlier is not just an education initiative, it's actually being run out of our um, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. It's a foreign policy initiative to have generations of young Australians living and studying in the region. I, I can't think of a better um, use mm. of the soft power dollar than to invest in a student exchange scheme. Mm. Uh, you're referring to Australia Network. That is a, a separate contract entered into by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and in this instance uh, the Australian Broadcasting Commission to provide um, content um, via a television and radio network into our region. Um, it is actually a soft power diplomacy initiative. Mm -hmm. It's not about the ABC promoting its news programs or whatever else into the region. It's actually meant to be fulfilling um, the Australian government's foreign policy objectives. Uh, my question is whether or not uh, there is an inherent conflict in having uh, the Australian Broadcasting Commission contracted to deliver Australian government messages into the region. And we've had the conflict um, writ large when it comes to the issue of asylum seekers and the issue of the Snowden allegations. The ABC is a, a news organisation, is perfectly entitled to report how it wishes into the region on those two contentious issues. But under a soft power diplomacy contract that's meant to be delivering a positive image of Australia into the region, um, but, but how does it do that? So we've, we've got it under review to see if there should be a different way of yeah. uh, delivering uh, Australia's message into mm. the region. Mm. But is, isn't it positive in itself that um, you know, ABC is, is airing issues which may not be uh, to the liking of the, of the government from time to time and questioning what the government does? I mean, the BBC does that all oh, the time. The ABC, yeah, yeah. The, the ABC is um, mm. more than mm. entitled to do that right. as a public broadcaster. Mm. My question is whether under a soft power diplomacy contract, mm. which is worth um, $230 million, mm. taxpayer funded, um, mm. is that the best use of taxpayers' money to project a positive into, um, image mm. into the region? The ABC has the right. capacity to project its news programs into the region. Apparently, you just right. lift the geo block and you can have ABC 24 um, streamed live into mm. the region. My question, and what I have to consider, is whether or not our scarce public diplomacy dollars yeah. should be spent on getting a, a media outlet, any media outlet, um, mm. to run the program. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, I, I think I think okay. perhaps in this day and age there are other ways of mm. of projecting mm. your soft power into our region. Okay, one last question from a gentleman here, <coughs> second row. Uh, 
Minister Julian Drape from Australian Associated Press. Um, you spoke about China's need uh, to be more uh, open and transparent in its discussions about military spending, especially in, in that context. Can I ask you about the, the Snowden leaks and what impact you think that has had on, on diplomatic relationships and trust between nations? Um, the very nature of um, intelligence activities is that it remains secret and uh, obviously um, Australia has benefited greatly from um, the work of our intelligence agencies and the cooperation we have with like-minded countries uh, in the context of counter-terrorism, the work of our defence forces and the like. Uh, the Snowden allegations um, were a tremendous blow to um, this work that has, uh, has saved lives around the world. Um, I do not see um, Snowden as a whistleblower. I see him as a traitor of the worst order to his employers, to his country, and uh, I believe that um, Australia has been harmed as a result of his treacherous acts. But I have great faith in our intelligence agencies. I have great faith in the work that they do. We have considerable oversight in Australia over their activities and we've had some very useful and productive discussions with the counterpart agencies <laughs> here in London since we've been here. Yeah. Uh, so I believe that it is um, a deeply unfortunate incident. Um, it will continue for some time as he chooses when and how to distribute more information. Um, it makes it difficult for us to um, work with some other countries, but at the end of the day there is a recognition that the intelligence work that we do has been beneficial for many nations and there will continue to be a need for it. And so I think that what Australia needs to do is to continue to um, talk about the need for intelligence activities, uh, the benefits that uh, we derive from it, and to reassure our public that we have appropriate oversight and that our agencies act um, appropriately and professionally in our national interest. Minister, thank you very much. It's 10 o'clock exactly on the dot. Um, thank you for sharing your thoughts uh, with us about Auckland and about Australia's position uh, in the region. Um, I'd like everybody for, to join me in thanking the, the Minister. <laughs> thank you very much.